Hello there, this is Vahid Arya Dust. I'm delighted to bring this video to you. Today I'm going to discuss differential item functioning. Uh, there are two types of differential item functioning, or DIF for short, uh, uniform and non-uniform. And in this video, I'm going to cover uh, some of the basic uh, requirements for uniform DIF. So I'm going to start with this data set. As you can see, uh, this data set has 800 people. That's the performance of 800 people on 10 polytomous items. Most of them are polytomous, some of them are dichotomous. So we have done a, uh, a uh, rating scale model, a rush Andrich rating scale model. The differential item functioning and uh, kind of analysis I'm going to do is across gender. So we have two samples or subsamples. One is females and the other one is male. So how, how am I going to do this? Actually, I'm just going to drag and drop into the WinStep software. And you see this window opens. Let me just fit it into a yes, into the window. And I'm going to click once. And the second time, as you see, the first time when I clicked enter, I got this question, extra specification. Do I have any extra specification? No, I didn't have any. Then it took 24 iterations for the model to converge which is not too bad, really. It's not, uh, I should say, there are not too many iterations, which is, I would say, good news. I have talked about these statistics in another video of reliability and all that, so I'm not going to discuss it anymore. Okay. Now, let's just right-click on this interface anywhere, really. Right-click anywhere, and you'll get more or less the same, uh, just exactly the same window. Uh, what I'm interested in to talk about today is tables 30. There are quite a few of them, and in this video presentation, I'm going to just cover videos, uh, sorry, tables 30.1, 30.2, and 30.3. At the interest of time, and I know this video is going to be quite long and draggy and <laughs> would probably make some of you bored, I will be discussing the rest of those tables in another video. So let's click on number 30, and from this drop down menu, click gender because that's the variable of interest and just click uh, display tables you can click on clicks so i'm going to keep this as the default says and suggests but i'm not going to do display graphs and display scatter plus the reason is simply because display tables uh, would give me a lot more more useful information because i'm more interested in looking at the stats rather than how they look like although this might not be a bad idea actually to, to include as well. So let's just get started with display tables, click OK, and yeah, you get the results of the analysis. The first table is 30.1, and how do we make sense of this? This is like a conventional differential item functioning kind of analysis where we have got one group in this analysis, females versus another group in this analysis, males. We could refer to one of them as the focal group and the other one is the reference group, or this one is the focal group and this one is the reference group, depending on your theoretical framework, really. But I should add that in language assessment research, I for quite a long time, I haven't seen anyone to use this terminology of focal versus, uh, uh, versus reference group. So I'm not going to use that in this presentation either, just to go by the tradition. Now, as you see right on top, we have quite a few subheadings that I'm going to go through quickly just to let you know what, they're, what they mean. Let's remember that our sample size included 800 people. So here, for the first class or the first group, which we have already identified, females, there is an observed minus expected average score, which is 0 0.11. I'm... I'm just uh, going to draw a box around it and draw a box around the same observed minus expected average for, for males. And if you compare these two, you'll see that, the, uh, uh, that observed minus expected average for females is larger than that for males. And how, how is it um, calculated? It's basically what we observe with the average score minus what the Rush model expects uh, that group to achieve on average. Here, uh, the expectations are 
um, basically uh, larger than what we observed. That's why we've got a negative value, whereas here the expectations are uh, smaller for this group, females. That's why we've got a positive value. Well, this is really some descriptive, uh, has some descriptive value to it. Um, we should also look at the diff measure. It's also a descriptive sort of measure. The diff measure for females, that's the difficulty measure. The average difficulty measure for female subgroup is minus 1.62, whereas that for males is minus 1.44. And there is a difference, a diff contrast of minus 1, uh, minus 0 0.018. Now, uh, each of these statistics have got a standard error. Uh, for example, this DEF measure has got a standard error of 0 0.06, which is not too high. Therefore, uh, we have some high level of certainty about this DEF. That's, this DEF uh, falls between minus 1.62 plus minus 0 0.06, which is not really that high. Therefore, I think the amount of certainty and reliability of this statistic here is is significantly high. And the same thing can be said about the DEF measure of males, which is 0 0.04, which is even smaller than that of the females. Now, the joint standard error is, is basically the standard error of DEF contrast. So do not confuse it with the addition of DEF SE for males and, and for females, because if you add 0 0.04 and 0 0.06, you won't get 0 0.07. Therefore, uh, this joint diff SE is simply the standard error of diff contrast. Now, there is uh, a comparison of a t-test, the famous student t-test, uh, which is also known as Rushwell's t here in this context, uh, to compare uh, the diff measure for, for males, minus 1.44, and that for females, minus 1.62. Uh, is it signif statistically significant? So in order to answer that question, we have to look at the p-values. The p-value here is 0 uh, 0 0.0166. So yes, definitely, it's statistically significant. And there is another way of looking at, at the differences between these two mean scores, and that's through the mantle method. That's a chi-square test, which also gives you a probability test of 0 0.0079. This test is basically used for polytomous data and because of uh, because most of the items in this sample are polytomous so the mantle chi-square test is automatically generated now look think about another scenario where your test items are uh, dichotomous in that case the mantle hansel test mantle hyphen hansel test with this probability will be estimated so these two are important that's why i'm using the color red and the third and also equally important statistic is size uh, a cum lore, that's cumulative log odd units, uh, which is minus 0 0.37. Um, so let's just call this statistic, statistic number one, that's the probability, and this one is number two. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, two, which you should look at uh, number two, and that's a very strange two, and then number three. So probability, probability, and and the size. Now we should make sense of the size as well, because for probability is the same standard kind of interpretation. As long as it falls below 0 0.05, it's statistically significant. But how about the size? For size, I'm going to refer you to this I should I should clean this. Okay, good. I'm I'm gonna refer you to uh, sorry to this website. So the website is here. It's uh, Windsteps website. It's uh, created by Dr. John Mike Lineker in a space and Zoix criterion, which was published in 1999 in the Journal of Educational Measurement and also as an ETS report. If you click on this link, you'll get the ETS report, the full report here. And if you have access to uh, the Journal of Journal of Educational Measurement, you can go and read the paper. Now, how do we make sense of it? 
Well, basically, if the logit, the 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 uh, def score, the sorry, the def size in terms of logits is below 0.0, 0 0.43, it's negligible, as you see. So even though it's statistically significant, it's not substantive size-wise. However, if it falls between uh, 0 0.43 and 0 0.64, below 0 0.64, it's going to be slight to moderate or level B, and level C, which is the highest, is anything that falls above 0 0.64, equal to or above 0 0.64. So if you're interested in publishing your deaf papers, and if you're curious, and you're, if you're looking for a criteria to make sense of those statistics, I think this is a very good, uh, a very good criteria to use. And this is the full report, which you can refer to. Now I'm going, going back to here, the, the table, which I was talking about. So we have so far, we have learned that in this table, we have learned the uh, probability, uh, Walsh, uh, Rush Walsh probability and uh, mantle probability, as well as the size of the diff, observed diff are important. And that's true about all the items. Now, if you go through this table, you only find one item which has a substantive and statistically significant diff statistics, and that's 0.0056 of p-value and minus uh, 0.54. And according to the criteria we just looked at, I think this is a moderate or level B uh, def analysis. Only one of these items have got a, a def size. Only one of these got items ha uh, has got a def uh, which is substantive, and that's item nine. And therefore, we should look into item nine more. Now, whether or not this is alarming, I think it depends on your test and the purposes for which the, the, the tests of the test scores are used. In this context, we're looking at a high stakes test of reading comprehension. Therefore, I think it's important that you follow up with this to see if it affects the fairness and validity of your test or not. Now, if you go further down, uh, you'll see more or less the same thing, males, uh, now, this time it has been shifted around to see males versus females. It doesn't matter. If you look at item nine, once again, right here, you see that the def size is the same, except that the direction is, is uh, different. It's minus here is plus, but the size is 0 0.54 because here we're subtracting females from males and here we're subtracting males from females, which doesn't really matter. So these two parts of the table are telling us exactly the same story and you can choose either of them depending on what kind of analysis you would like to report. The second part, however, is a bit different from that conventional def analysis which I showed you, because here we're comparing females, not versus males, but versus a baseline. A baseline actually refers to the entire sample, including 278 females and 513 males together they give us the entire sample, that's 800 people. So females, 287 versus 800 uh, on item one. In the same way, we're comparing males, uh, th that's the responses of males, uh, which, are, uh, who are, which are 513 people who took item one versus the entire sample, which is 800. Uh, of course, the sample is not symmetrical in terms of size, and that's one of the things that you should consider. It's better to have a sample which is symmetrical, so uh, you will not um, uh, get a biased analysis from the get-go. Observations average is 2.92. This is a polytomist test. I think it's a 2.92 out of 4 for females, but for the entire sample, it gives us 2.80. So around 11, 0 0.11 to 0 0.12, if you round it down, logits is the difference between the, uh, the baseline and the female performance. And the depth measure for this observation is minus 1.62. Uh, what is the depth size? And it's one of those important things which I mentioned. I'm going to use this, uh, the same red color which I used above. So the depth size is minus. Uh, 0.11, and the probability of this test is 
um, um, 0 0.0569, which is not statistically significant. Now we can go down this column to find out if there are any statistically significant differences between males or females and the baseline or not. And here you see there's nothing except this one. Uh, what is uh, the, the def size? Actually, the def is pretty small and negligible because it's way below 0 0.43. It's 0 0.14. So it's, it doesn't have any substance. So it, can, it can be ignored in the context of Rush measurement of unidimensional tests. Uh, there is another way of displaying the same table. Actually, it's just a really a matter of how you want to arrange it. It's females first. Oh, sorry. Um, first comes females in the first block. Then we have another block for males, which is exactly the same thing here. We have alternated females and males. It doesn't matter. So you'll get exactly the same statistics. Now, table 30.4 is telling us a different story. I would like to elaborate on this uh, in another video. I just want to mention a few more things about uh, publishing your papers and data if you're interested to publish. In this paper, I have discussed differential item functioning of a listening test, a listening comprehension test, which is a high stakes test. And the formula is that you should talk about a few things. Um, these are the list, links of the videos, which I will, uh, sorry, the links of uh, some of these papers, which I will provide you with. So number one is item statistics. Number two, by item statistics, I'm, I mean difficulty, for example, difficulty and fit statistics. I've talked about this in another video. The other one is reliability, reliability for both items and and persons and number three is the two requirements of unidimensionality sorry there's a typo there i will correct it and local independence uh let me just okay just correct it. unidimensionality test only after you have discussed this can you talk about def def results Okay, so this formula is there in this paper. You can see how I have used that formula, as well as this is in International Journal of Listening, uh, volume 26, published in 2012. And this is uh, Language Assessment Quarterly, volume 8, issue 4, 2011. So you can take a look to see how this differential item functioning analysis has been conducted. If you're curious about other types of deaf analyses, yes, there are a lot more. And in this paper published in Studies in Educational Evaluation, we have discussed partitioning rush trees. I'm hoping that I will find time to discuss this in another video for you if you are still interested. Uh, one more thing that I would like to discuss is the impact of rush measurement on different fields. Again, I will have to make another video for this. Uh, this is called in this paper, which, which was just published recently in 22nd of October, we have used a scientometric view, uh, review of 5,369 papers published in the field of rush, published involving rush measurement and different kinds of analyses. It shows that rush measurement has, has had a significant influence on different fields, including medicine and education. Uh, uh, I will be posting all of these uh, links if just in case you are interested to follow up. If you like the video, uh, please give it a like and uh, also let your friends or students know that this media has been made. Thank you very much for your attention. Feel free to uh, paste your questions under, uh, I mean, in the comment section. I'll be happy to answer them if I can. Uh, have a good day. Thank you.